So I recently mm-hmm. lived my nightmare. I was on a plane, right? And the people go down the aisle and you see the flight attendant and she's like grabbing a medical kit off of it. And I was like, this is not happening. This is not happening in my life right now. Uh, she goes up front. They make the announcement over the overhead speakers. Are there any healthcare people? I think she said healthcare providers, which I was proud of them for that. They changed their language away from like doctor. Are there any healthcare providers on board the plane? If so, please come to the front. And I was like, surely there's others. Surely I'm in the back of the plane. Right. So I can see if anyone is going to stand up and no one stood up. I did wait a moment. And then I was like, well, I have to do this and fueled by pure adrenaline, because if you know me, This is my nightmare. Okay. Scott's here. We have our whole panel. So this is Scott's time to shine. And I walked up the aisle. You guys know nurse Scott thinking this should be Scott. I don't know how I got to the front of the plane because I was just thinking this is my nightmare. And I got to experience the, what happens when you are a healthcare human on a flight in the middle of the sky and things are happening to people. So today we're going to talk about what that looks like from a person's point of view who is trying to help. We're not going to talk about the patient that ended up being in this situation. Um, We're going to discuss what is normally on an airplane, what resources there are, because that was interesting. What happens like logistically, uh, what you should know in terms of like legal responsibilities, right? Uh, What you should know in terms of what options there are to you. You're going to learn how um, crappy. A lot of medical kits are on airplanes. We also have a super wonderful special guest, Nick, who is a flight attendant. So they're going to share all of their insights from that aspect, because the flight attendants, let me tell you, I was panicking on the insight and they were just like, this is Tuesday. So shout out to flight attendants and just discuss, see if anyone else has experiences of flying in the sky. If you have had the horrifying experience (laughs) being the human in the sky when they're like, is anyone else here? Do let us know. And we'll just sit around and, you know, chit chat and all the good things. Let's bring our people, let's bring the panel on and welcome them. And then we'll get going. We have Chad. Oh, let me see if I can turn on names. Where are her names? Show display names. Perfect. Chad, Nick, Adrian, Scott was here. You know, he abandoned us. What's new? What's new? He's, he's not really into this, I know, but here we go. Um, so, Nick, welcome. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, our, Nick. Flight attendant, our flight attendant friend who's going to tell us all the things. Okay. <laughs> and Adrian, uh, everyone has social media linked down below. Uh, Adrian, do you have social? Or I know Adrian does. Nick, do you have social media? No, I'm afraid. No. Okay. That's very fair. Social media is very mean. I don't blame you for being afraid. I'm on like an Instagram, like, but like, I'm just not on TikTok and Instagram at the moment because they just scared me and I left. Um, everyone else will have all of their social media linked down below and you can go and check it out. Um, okay. So airplanes. Oh, Arian's here too. Hello. Welcome. Hey. Critical care hey. things. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So I was so on this airplane, right? When you stand up and you go to the front, I didn't know most of these things. So I'm assuming most of you don't know them either. Um, And now you will. So when you go up, and this is also not a universal experience, Nick, let me know if this is like where I'm wrong and feel free to interject absolutely whenever. You go to the front of the plane, right? When you're the healthcare person. First of all, you should know that there's a law in place that I did not know existed, but it does. And it protects you from basically being sued as long as you don't do anything like super duper crazy. Okay. This was beneficial. Scott's back because I was terrified uh, that I was going to do something that was going to possibly right. Like what happens if I do this and someone gets hurt? I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in family medicine. My background's like med surge and peds. Uh, So I was like, I'm not an emergency person. (laughs) What if this is bad? But there's this, there's the aviation medical assistance act. It came out in 1998 and it basically says, as long as you are not drunk, And as long as you are not doing something so egregious that like anyone looking, you know, that a regular, a bystander who has no medical training would be like, excuse me, what? And as long as you are not doing something wildly outside your scope of practice. So saying like, Hey, I can definitely do that when you definitely can't, you're not going to get sued. Okay. So this is pretty much preventing against that. You don't want to go with your, cause at first I was like, Oh, it's probably a good Samaritan law. Apparently, Good Samaritan laws are state based, and this is a federal you are fine type of ruling. So we've got that, and that sounds great. Um, So you are protected a wee little bit. Number two, these are like my two good things. Okay, I have like two or three good things, and then it's going to shock you to know we go downhill drastically after that. Number two, there's a headset 
Okay. I don't know if this is on all planes, but there's a headset that they can give you and it connects you to a human on the ground who is a healthcare. This person that I talked to was a physician and they were going to guide you through the process. If you were unsure, right. Of what you needed to do, they could give you recommendations. They were there to basically guide the experience or in other things. Like in my situation, they also were very good at like, not good, but like they were very much like, Hey, if you seem to know what you want to do, like, please by all means do. Uh, and then you can, but you are not alone in the situation, which is what I was terrified of. Is that It would be me like by myself and someone else with you, Nick, is that pretty standard across like most things? Well, yeah, my airline, definitely. We have those headsets available pretty much on every aircraft except for the very old ones. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we do have that headset available. And we have the tools really to take care of people as much as necessary if we're across the ocean and can't land. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. So we've got to be able to, either with medical assistance or on our own, be able to help at least to a point where we can get onto the ground and go to a higher level of care. So it is, yeah, I'm glad. It, well, I want to hear your story, Liz. Let's okay. Go. I'll say my story. And then I have so many questions for you. Um, and so, <laughs> okay. So we have this, I get the headset, right? Um, a lot of things happen. We are actively landing, which is why not? Why not in my nightmare? And me also, if you don't know, I have like 10 out of 10 fear of planes, at the worst, when we're landing, okay? I am horrified that we're going to land and the plane is going to like catch on fire, especially with brakes. I am like clutching my seat or like <laughs> anything. So we're in like inception levels of Liz's nightmare, right? Okay, also it's like, I haven't slept in like days. It's a thing. So this is all happening like while we are descending. Um, so that was fun. Um, other things that happen. So you're taking care of this human, uh, the medical kits. So I was, the plane I was on had what I then learned was a very nice medical kit. I did not know that there could be lesser medical kits. There are, we're going to talk about them. They, there's a lot to be left desired. Uh, one thing that I did learn, we're going to go over like what exactly in his medical kit is you can't take a blood pressure on a plane, right? Um, because they give you a manual blood pressure cuff and then they give you a disposable stethoscope and you're on a plane and you go to listen and all you hear is and you're like, oh, this is so helpful. I am so happy. There is a medical kit, Adrian, though. There's a medical kit and it has in it, um, let me see, we can pull up. It has certain medicines. It has to have all of these things, okay? So per FAA regulations, FAA is like the people who approve the sky, okay, federally. I don't know what it stands for. Flying. Federal FAA. Aviation Administration. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like flying people apparatus. Not that. Um, so the, these are what they have to include, okay? A sphygma manager, whatever, that's a blood pressure cuff, okay? You also have to assemble it, fun fact. They hand it to you, you needs to be assembled. The wonderful flight attendant, one of them put it together for me and then handed it to me and said, this will be useless. They were correct. Um, a stethoscope. You have to have an oral, like an airway. You have to have a self-inflating manual resuscitation mask. We did not need that. Thank goodness. You needed a cardiopulmonary resuscitation mask. You needed IV tubing. And it, I was like, why is there so much IV tubing in here? Who is starting in? Like, that would be my nightmare, last resort. Like, I have to start an IV. Well, I learned there's IV tubing because um, all the emergency medicine is IV. There's no stab, like auto injectors. Why? We have auto injectors like for epinephrine, if you're having an allergic reaction. No, no, friend, you have to like calculate a dose, draw it up and give it through an IV that you somehow placed. I wouldn't be able to place an IV because I haven't, I never did it. I learned in school and then I went princess at the hospital I worked at as a nurse. And they said, no, princess, you don't do that. We have a team for that. I said, bless you. Never did it. Okay. And then, so I've been in healthcare 12 years never had to place an IV. This person would have had serious trouble. There's needles. Uh, there's antihistamines. There's like a Tylenol. There's syringes uh, so that you can draw up these medicines. There's atropine injections. You know, if we have some heart is like issues, an aspirin. There's a bronchodilator in uh, inhaler in case someone is having asthma issues. There's a dextrose injection 
But remember, you need an IV. We could have glucagon in just a stabby, stabby pen. The plane I was on had glucose, glucagon in a stabby, stabby pen. Thank goodness. Um, an epinephrine injection. So this is what you all need. Nitroglycerin. You have a 500 milliliter bag of saline. And basic, I like this, basic instructions for use of drugs in the kit. Um, so that's what you get. You can, this is the minimum, right? Okay. Your kit can include a lot more things that we are missing here, just based on looking at them. Uh, Narcan, a high opioid overdose that we are dealing with in our country, right? We don't have Narcan. Um, the plane I was on did. We don't have an EpiPen for like automatic injection. If someone is like not breathing in front of you, I want the quickest thing in the plane to stab and go. Nothing to reverse a seizure was um, is required. Uh, the plane I was on had something to help reverse a seizure. Uh, just some little thing like a no glucometer. I had to ask a, on the over count, like whatever they had to say over the plane. Does anyone have supplies to like a glucometer? Someone did. They came up and brought it. Uh, they did not have a, like I said, a manual blood pressure cuff would have been a delight because we were kind of just like flying blind. Um, but anyway, so these are the things it has. I'm excited to hear what Nick has to say about like, does your airline have more? The one I was on had a lot more. So I didn't know till I got home and I was going down this rabbit hole. I was like, oh, like that was kind of like well put together. And then the internet was like, this is awful. And I went down the rabbit hole. So anyway, we're with this person. We land. Landing was an interesting experience. Um, we get off, like the plane lands and then it like pulls over, right? Which I didn't even know it could do because it doesn't want to, you know, we're like far away from our gate. The plane kind of just like veered, took a little left. Like we landed, it took a left. This truck came up with a ladder. It zoom, zoomed up, went down and I had to go talk to the paramedic. Didn't think I would have to go do that, but we took the person off, put them in the ambulance. They wanted me to go with them to the hospital because they're like, you assumed care of this human. I said, no. It's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm not going into Philadelphia without my, like, I'm just not doing that. The paramedic said, okay, we came to a conclusion. I had not done anything wildly drastic. The person was, you know, going to be stable. They would take them. They left. And then I got back on the plane and they asked me questions. I had to verify like my license basically. Cause I had to swear to this person on the phone. Uh, when I was on the phone, like that, I was who I was. They're like, well, you know, they kind of take you at your word. They're like, do you swear that you are? A nurse practitioner was like, yep, like I do. And then I went forward, gave him my license. And then I just walked back to my seat and that was it. It was very, it was weird. People offered me money in the aisle. It was odd. Um, I don't ever want to do that again. And that was my experience. I have done it one other time, but the person was just having a panic attack. It was like the easiest thing. I walked up and they were like, oh, they're like, I'm having a heart attack. I was like, no, you're not because they were, it, they were not, they were not sweaty. They were all, they were okay. They were just like very 10 out of 10 nervous and me like coming up and like putting my arm on them made them feel better. Um, and that's hopefully what you will experience. That was what I experienced the worst. Nick, <laughs> any insights on this yeah, on was, side of things? Yeah. You had a serious medical emergency there. I, I was in the unfortunate statistic where it's like, this will never really happen to you. Yeah, of course. It definitely escalated. And like, I'm glad you brought up that the not having a pulse ox. Well, I don't know if you said that. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't even say that. No, like we didn't have a pulse ox thing either yeah. in the thing. So, so. Pulse ox and also a thermo like a temporal thermometer. They're coming soon at my airline. They're coming soon. But that was something that I encountered during COVID being actually kind of irritated that there were medical emergencies during COVID and you wanted me to how do, how was I supposed to assess this passenger in any meaningful way without a pulse ox, a forehead thermometer, you know, basically. Yeah. yeah. So what I, kind of training do they give you? So we go, our training is about eight weeks. Um, most of that is spent on security and safety related items. Most yeah. of it has to do with evacuating the airplane, but a good, a fair amount is spent on um, any scenario that could occur in the air up to and including Mr. Midwife giving birth. Well, no, no thank you. I <laughs> hope I don't. I hope I never give birth on a plane. Immediately, no. But it's happened and it's happened. Oh, I believe it. Recently as like last December, I believe. Oh and my gosh. These things tend to happen. The really big events happen over the ocean. 
So of course they do. Yeah. yeah. So coming yeah. out of Hawaii, going into Europe, those are when those events you can't you can't land. There's nowhere to land. You know, it takes just as long to get back to land as it does to get to where you're going. So that's when I guess the baby's just gonna be born. And we do have a manual. It's a very, very long <laughs> manual. And we go through all you have time to read that, right? Yeah. For some light <laughs> reading mid, like, please stop seizing for one moment. I would really just like to read on page 742 what we do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, don't push. I, I got to yeah. read upon this. Hold on. Hold on. 100%. So we go over this in initial training, right? And then we go to training every year and do a refresher. But of course, we don't cover everything in that refresher. But... um but yeah, we would pull out the manual and we would go, if there was no medical provider on board and we'd just go down that list and get it done if we really had to, you know? Well, I am wildly impressed because seriously, like I was having, I was panicking. Um, I don't know if you could see it on the outside, but maybe the flight attendants could because they were very nice to me. They kind of were like, are you okay? I'm like, uh, not really. Um, but they were like cool as cucumbers. They were just like, okay. Like the situation was not ideal. And they were just like, okay, like we can handle this. This will be fine. Like yeah. hopefully yeah. the patient is fine. And then this person that showed up will like not die of anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> due to and, all and factors. You know, Adrian had mentioned the other day about uh, early morning Vegas flights. Yes. It, I work on Sunday, Mondays and Tuesdays. So um, coming out of Las Vegas early in the morning, people tend to just kind of hit the ground and we all know what that is it's probably dehydration and intoxication from the night before and yeah it's funny we i've been surprised at my own calmness in those situations yeah like, huh. the, those flight attendants they have kind of an emergency nurse attitude like look yeah. getting excited is not going to help the situation my job number one take a deep breath i got this what needs to be done yeah yep. okay let's do that let's call for help let's yeah Absolutely. And I know you guys are highly trained. I've seen it before. It's amazing. You're like jumping out of the side of the plane, yeah. you know, onto those, those um, inflatable chutes and everything. I mean, they, they walk the walk. It is so much fun. We get to go down that slide one time, one time only, and it's fun, but hopefully only once. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> hopefully just the one time. <laughs> that looked... But yeah, I look up to all you guys so much. I just started watching you during the pandemic, Nurse Liz, and I listening to you guys talk. I was like, these are my people. <laughs> I love that. Like us. Like, <laughs> your thing sounds just like us. Yeah. Can we? I think there's a lot of like similarities, her? you know, like Maybe between the two. Is in your future. Maybe nursing school I in your future. I'm taking three recs now, and I say to myself, you can do hard things. Just like there you go. Yeah. That was literally well, you know, what I said when I was walking up. After I stopped being like, Scott, this should have been stupid Scott. Like, this is somehow his fault. I was like, okay, Liz, you can do hard things. <laughs> You, well, you know, do... historically, historically, when aviation was new, I'm going to, should I tell this or let Nick tell this? No, you tell it me. was new to assure the public that, look, it is safe to get in this plane that will go up and blow through the air. They hired nurses to be on there as the first flight attendants to be there to yeah. make people comfortable. Oh, and really? Because everybody and saw the on. Hindenburg. That's why. And so <laughs> she trusted nurses. People trusted nurses even back then, and the, the airline companies knew that. And they said, you know you know what would make our passengers feel safe? Having a nurse on there. And it evolved. Their profession came out of ours. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, interesting. When you think I about who even like the history of you know women in the workforce, we only could work in a few industries mm -hmm. to start out. And flight attendants, teachers, nurses, secretaries, you know, so... That in those it. caring professions, you find a lot of similar personalities and a lot of similar um, types of scenarios in the workplace that are, you know, emotionally draining and yeah. sometimes doesn't recognize what kind of emotional labor it actually takes to do our jobs. Yeah. And underpaid. And don't forget underpaid. And you've already have experience dealing with combative individuals. So that's right. already put you ahead as an, a future nurse. Oh, and you I know how to, yeah. oh yeah. I work in psych already. I mean, yeah, I already did it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know you how to, to talk to people and how to public. figure out triage, which is really all you need yeah. to like know in that situation. Um, Scott, you were saying that you know a tip for getting a blood pressure. 
Yeah, I was thinking in that noisy environment when you can't hear your Karatkov sounds, you know, where the beats start and stop, um, what you can do is inflate the, the, the blood pressure cuff up, let the pressure out slowly like you would do and feel for a radial pulse. And where the radial pulse starts, that's your systolic. You won't have a bottom number, but you will have a top number. Oh, that's interesting. That makes mm -hmm. sense. So if you're not familiar with like manual blood pressure cuffs, uh, the way they usually it works is you put the cuff on the person, you blow it up when you, and you just, you hear for like, when does the pulse disappear? And then when does it reappear? And those are your two numbers that you go off of. And obviously if you're in an airplane, you don't, but if you're Scott, you know how to do emergency things and you're not a princess like me. Who's like, where's, where's yeah, my I also know how to spend an IV. <laughs> Just put a tourniquet on them and yeah. loosen it up and then we feel for that pulse. Yeah. Fine. Well, and the, the other thing is if they have a radial pulse, then their systolic is at least 90. If they have a brachial pulse, their systolic is at least 70, 80. 70. And if they have a 70. femoral pulse, it's 70. at least 60, 70. Yeah. So if they don't oh, have a brachial we'll pulse, there you but go. they do have a, a femoral pulse, then you know it's between 60 and 70. It's not good. Not high enough to get down here, but it's good enough to get here. Well, that's good to know. See, I didn't know that because I've lived in princess land for a long time. Well, I think that was, I think that was like emergency pre-hospital training. So you, you wouldn't be expected yeah. to know it's that. It's okay. Liz. I, there's, there's a lot of people that can't even do a, a manual blood pressure yeah. nowadays. <laughs> nowadays. Touché. You work, but if you work cardiology, you will learn. <laughs> we will learn. And in primary care, I always did them a lot because I was like, that's not right. That's not right. My dude, that's, it would be like your blood patient's blood pressure is like 300 over 210. I was like, I don't, I don't think so, <laughs> but let's just make sure. <laughs> let's just make sure. Um, and Ariel, you said, did you have to place an IV in someone in the air? How did that go? I did. Yeah. Nightmare. So I was, it, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm from emergency medicine and critical care, so um, I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit more like Scott. So I'm. So were you of, like excited uh, when you were walking up the aisle? You were like, "This is my moment." I mean, honestly, I sat in my seat for a hot minute because they, of course, said, "Is there a doctor on the flight?" Because mm -hmm. it was first of all, it was an international flight. We were coming from Thai, We were coming from uh, Tokyo to Chicago, so the flight attendants were. Japanese um oh. and so and new speak layer English yeah speak English obviously the flight attendants do speak English um but you know they were asking for is there a doctor on the on the flight um and nobody came the person was close is close to me was um in my area because it was a huge plane because it's an international yeah. flight so it's like four different compartments um, and so nobody got up or came to this individual. So I was like, so I got up and I went over and um, it was an American person. Um, so they were thankful to have somebody who spoke English. Um, I will say that a Korean physician did come over, but he did not speak any English and was not really making the patient feel safe. Um, but yes, I had to place an IV um, in air. Um, I was able to get um, a BP and it was low. Um, and all signs pointed to the fact that the patient was hypotensive. Um, and so I ended up starting a line and um, giving fluids um, and uh, thankfully they improved with the bag of fluid um, enough. So I didn't get a headset. That was not something that was offered to me. You might not have looked I panicked don't... enough. I think she saw it in my yeah. eyes. She's like, give the girl the headset yeah. immediately. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was like, I don't, I, I was never offered a headset. Um, I think in the international <laughs> flights, it's a little more of a free for all. I think, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. And you're just on your like, own. <laughs> yeah. They were really basically like, please do not tell us that we have to try to land this plane somewhere in the between, you know, Tokyo and Chicago, because literally Sully could do it. Open. You can do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sully can do it. <laughs> well, I was not offering What's to the, problem? Fly the plane. <laughs> I was not offering to fly the plane at all. That that would make me anxious. Um, no, but yeah, so I started a line. Um, I just sat, I had them clear, clear a row so that I could, you know, get to the 
so that we weren't a a spectacle you know for the entire plane and so I had them clear a row and move some people and then um, I just sat there and monitored the person and thankfully um, fluids immediately perked perked them up and um, we were able to continue um, the flight and every you know a leader and then because I, I saw it at list, it was a 500 bag, and I'm like, only a 500 bag of fluid that's not going to get you 500 gets yeah. you yeah. around. <laughs> no, they had two fives, um, and then I also um, had them um, had them give him this person three bottles of water that I made right. yeah. them take, and so by that point, and me sitting there and kind of you know, talking, I actually had a pulse ox on me because um, hmm. I'm an ER nurse. And so I carry random things in my backpack for travel. Uh, you know, I also have Narcan usually in my bag. Um, so, you know, there's, I, if, you know, I have a kit, you know, there's just things I carry for random reasons. Um, and Not so, it. yeah. I get it. I'm not the only person. <laughs> I, think I found my people. no. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. So, um, but yeah, so I gave, yeah, we were they were very thankful that you know they didn't have to, you know, they didn't have to land the plane, um, in like Frankfurt or you know, or I mean, honestly, when it's Tokyo to Chicago, you're going over the Pacific. So we were yeah. Over the Pacific. What are you gonna do? Yeah, yeah. and we go. Mm -hmm. You go like across Alaska like you know so you go like way up so like not a lot of places to stop we probably yeah we probably would have had to like land in LA or something um I I don't know I Nick would probably know um <laughs> over me but um yeah so I and then I you know every couple hours I would go and check on them and make make sure they were okay and um kind of recheck BP and um and then uh the very nice uh, flight attendants came up to me at one point and asked for my name um, and I gave it to them. And then they um, came up and gave me um, a $200 voucher for any flight oh. to the airline as a thank you for um, taking care of the emergency. So. Yeah. That was nice. Which was very nice Nick. of them. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for that. Um, <laughs> wasn't the reason that I did it. So yeah. If someone gave me that, I'd be like, you think I'm ever getting on a plane again after this experience? No, <laughs> I'll walk. I just, Thank you. I, I'm kind of curious, like at what point, you know, especially on a flight like that, where you really don't have a lot of means to continue assessing a patient. I mean, yeah. one, we, you know, we're all sitting here we want to know the cardiac rhythm, right? We want to know what's actually yeah. going on, mm -hmm. what's happening, yeah. right? Yeah. And that length of flight where you may have six or eight more hours, I mean, obviously the captain is in charge. So that is the person making all the decisions. Um, whether or not you have a somebody on the, you know, on a headset or not, but it, I'm just curious at what point, um, you know, with that plane say, okay, we are going to figure out a place because if it's the difference of five hours or four hours, that's a big difference, especially if, you know, if somebody's had a stroke, for example, um, or any, any number of things. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm just yeah. curious at what point then that decision is made or typically is made. I, I like factually, I would love to see like times that planes have stopped and what was actually going on with the patient or where they've, you know, diverted um, because yeah. of the lengthy flight or where they oh, maybe to. Nick, can tell us. Nick probably knows the rule. Well, yeah, I'm not sure there, if there's a hard and fast rule, but for one, we certainly do defer to any medical personnel on board. And if you say we need to divert, we need to land, then we're diverting and we're landing. Mm -hmm. But we're also empowered to make that call because I know there have been times, now I was on the ground, but I've said, no, this patient can't continue. He mm -hmm. had passed out and you know they were going to try to get him back. I was like, no, he can't continue. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care what EMS says, he's not safe to fly. I don't know what's going on with him and he can't come with us. I'm so sorry. Um, mm -hmm. But also, yes, if at any point, anyone along that chain, anyone involved says we need to go where we need to land, then we will. And um, 
It can be at a military air base. That happens. Mm -hmm. There are little islands all across the Pacific. You know, we could go to Guam or little places in Alaska where we can land and, you know, and, and seek treatment there if, if that's the course. I've diverted personally to Bermuda, going from New York to the Dominican, I believe. We, we ended up going to Bermuda. Um, that was the most serious medical event that I've encountered. Um, and I held the IV bag. Uh, so like, in, and it was also in Spanish. And I speak a little bit of airplane related Spanish, but not enough to <laughs> communicate yeah. to the aircraft that, hey, we're going to a different country right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stay up in the front of the airplane. Don't worry about what's going on back here. But, um, and so in those times, that's when you really employ all of your resources. You're getting someone to translate the announcements for you. You're yeah. communicating with the doctors. And, you know, there's usually four to eight to 11 flight attendants on a plane. And we each have our specific roles that we go into um, immediately. And um, I remember when I was in training day one, they said, no one ever dies on our airplanes. And I said, oh, that is great. We are we are amazing at our jobs. And then I realized a few years into it, it's because we don't have the authority to pronounce that anyone has passed away on our, on our airplanes. And it's one of these things, too, because I've heard you guys talk in the past about, like, the um, not having closure, not knowing what has happened mm -hmm. to someone. Because yeah. these things happen, we divert to another country, he comes off the airplane and we continue on, you mm -hmm. know, like, is everything okay? Like, mm -hmm. and no, it's not always okay, you know? Um, and, but those incidents you would think maybe could be like the worst flights ever, but universally they have always been my best flights ever. They have been the most meaningful human experiences I have ever had. You come off, hugging passengers you come mm -hmm. up those are the days i felt the most useful in yeah. life you know where i'm like oh i actually get to do my job and mm -hmm. contribute to something that matters here and um yep she's a nurse all right <laughs> <laughs> yes she is yep you're already there yep <laughs> yeah I think so. And I, and I hate to say this because I'm like, is a modern day nursing calling that you subscribe to nurse Liz? I think it is like that's mm -hmm. it is a requirement. Yes. Is a requirement. And if you survive this channel and still want to do it, I mean, you're fine. You're going to be just I mean, fine. I go in and out. I do. Yeah. I really do. I'm like, okay, nurse Liz and I are similar enough and let me be wise here and believe the things that someone who's been through it is telling me. <laughs> Am I willing to maybe endure that? Maybe. Well, well, I will tell you this. If you're a nurse, the hospital will never fall out of the sky. Yes. So you don't have to worry about the hospital mm -hmm. crashing. Mm -hmm. um, you will not be serving drinks to 200 people who, you know, are dehydrated and, and cranky. Um, Lots you won't of have turkey to usher sandwiches, everybody, though. You don't have to usher everybody in and out of the ER in an orderly fashion. So the there's bathrooms are so much bigger in hospitals. Well, you may have to restrain with duct tape, them. though. You may yeah. have to use duct tape yeah. for restraints. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. You might have to do that. I'm ready for that. Just kidding. We're just kidding, everybody. That never happens. <laughs> this is the thing, Scott, too. Like, these incidents have happened. And I mean, I've had overdoses, multiple intoxicating events, of course. And to the best of our ability, we try to involve as few people as possible. And I know I take great pride in sometimes knowing that the people in a certain section of the aircraft didn't even know anything was happening. Yeah. We that continue on with the service, you know, in a responsible way. But yeah, there's a lot of hats to juggle. Yeah. That's very impressive. Anxiety is a big one. That's the big one. I was going to say, like, what's the most, well, I have two questions. First, do they have translator phones for, like, if you do speak a different language? Or what do you do in that situation? So, so when we're going to a country, um, like, when I started, I was a French speaker. Um, I translated the announcements in French and <clears throat> was also a flight attendant as well. Mm -hmm. When we're going to a country where there's a primary other language spoken, we usually have one 
two or three translators on board who are also flight attendants. So they would be the ones who intervene. And then, uh, you know, actually, this is a good question. This comes up in in training. They say, if you don't speak the language, what do you do? You turn to your fellow passengers and ask them Mm -hmm. to help. Because one thing we've learned post 9-11 is mm-hmm. that passengers are our greatest resource. A lot of the mm-hmm. times our able-bodied passengers are more than willing to step in and be heroes, you know. And even if that's just translating for us, that's huge. Yeah. It's slower, but we do have Wi-Fi service in the air now. And you can get on Google Translate. And there are, you know, you're not just left in a lurch to figure out what is yeah, this person true. trying to say to me, you know, pointing to their heart or pointing to, you know. We got a little bit of help. but. Um, I was going to say two things. One, I want to hear what, I know Liz doesn't want to give too many details about the patient she took care of for obviously for privacy reasons, but I'd love to hear kind of what general kind of problem it was and what her general approach was. And also um, I've got, I, again, I've always wanted to do this. It should have been me. You're absolutely should right. have. <laughs> I should have had my little red box with me. I should have, you know, had my Narcan in the backpack like uh-huh. Arian said. Um, I have a couple of ideas about how to how to work without a monitor, without all the equipment, and still be of some use. But I guess, but I guess I want Liz first to tell us a, a little more about her story. Yeah, so I don't want to give away like a bunch a bunch of details. It was a person who I got very lucky that it was something that I've seen a lot in my own practice. So I was very comfortable with it. So that was like one of the few things you could have handpicked other than like, I think, I mean, the thing I'm most comfortable with is cardiac surgery. And we were not going to go into that. We were not going to do that on a plane. So like, it wasn't that, um, it ended up being something that devolved into a neurological, uh, situation, um, which if you ever need to make like, uh, seizure pads or something on an airplane coats, my friends, just ask all of first class for their coats, just put them all over. It works very well. Um, and so we were tackling neurological stuff as well as blood sugar stuff, uh, and then a requirement for oxygen. So it was, they were in a bit of a a situation, um, but I didn't have to do CPR. So that was (laughs) bonus. And it was something that I was familiar with, which I was very grateful for. And the person was awake enough when I first got there to very quickly spit out a very brief medical history of the things that they knew were going to be pertinent. And that was wildly helpful. So if anything else that I would learn from the experience was before you introduce yourself or say anything before like, if they're going to, you know, pass out or something, just what, is there anything you need to tell me? But I mean, this person just like came straight out and like right away said it which was very helpful. I think the flight attendants had already talked to them and gotten them to that point where they realized like, oh, this is probably going to be pertinent information uh, because they seemed very like, you know, here, tell them. Um, I also have, before I forget, because my brain will forget, uh, data. I have the data on the diversion rates of when aircraft have to get diverted and when they have to land. Um, so of all the things that happen on a plane, right, here's kind of the list of the things that are the most common, um, in terms of diversion. So this is not the most common of how they happen. This is how often they get diverted. So syncope gets diverted the most. That's the most often when they'll land the plane. That's when you pass out and people can't get you to wake up. It also gets sent to the hospital, um, you know, a decent amount. So these are the percentages over in this column. So out of 400 and, you know, however many flights of with someone with syncope, 221 of them, 5% of the time they had to land because it was sync, like someone passed out. Respiratory symptoms seems to be a huge one. If you have a heart attack, they seem to land the plane. That's the most common reason why they will land a plane followed by having a baby. Okay. So cardiac arrest. 50. Oh, so complications. They stop it like cardiac symptoms. Like I'm having chest pain, 18.4 here. It was 57.9% of the time. They will say, let's divert this. If they think you are actively having a heart attack or your heart stopped, not ideal. Having a baby goes right up there. They're like, not, no, thank you. Not on this airplane. Um, and all of these are linked down below. If you want to like go through and like nerd out on what causes it ear pain, very rarely will divert the plane, but two inst in one instance it did. And I just would like to know how that went down. Be like, <laughs> be like, you should, we should probably land and see the captain being like, okay, like <laughs> I will take your word for that. We will do it. Um, 
strokes is kind of up there, possible stroke, allergic reaction, um, seizures, abdominal pain. Uh, those were kind of like the big reasons, but only 7.3% overall when there was a medical problem needed to divert, at least in this study. So it looks, I think they did like 11,000 passenger, a, a lot of a good, decent chunk of flights that they kind of like collected all the data from. So that's how often they divert in case you're curious ish not terribly often. And it's usually for, oh dear, do not have a baby here or please don't, please, your heart should really restart. <laughs> I have a question. I mean, most, I watch some of those videos where like people are being really ridiculous before they get on planes. So is the reason that like drunkenness or like overdose or something like that is not higher the highest because that's kind of what I would think would be the highest um is it because they never are allowed on the plane to begin with because they're like already disorderly or stumbling or slurring or whatever making a scene yeah I would think that that is the reason because um per FAA regulations passengers who appear to be intoxicated are not permitted on board an aircraft and that's always a struggle kind of between um gate agents and flight attendants because gate agents just want to get them on the plane mm -hmm. and we, we want them off. And so mm -hmm. nobody really wants to deal with it. And um, I put my foot down in these instances because I have tried to be nice and I'll try to let people go and been thrown up on, you know? And so that mm -hmm. I, I realized that that is not something there's so many reasons other than beyond just, unruly behavior but like anything could happen when someone's under the influence oh and, for sure yeah and my theory on these flights a lot of them get diverted to kansas city it seems because that's right over in the middle of the country coming out of la if you've noticed there's a trend my theory on that is that it's because people take edibles and interesting so like alcohol intoxication is much easier to pot and smell, right? But I think people take edibles. This is my theory. They take edibles before they fly and they kick in somewhere across the middle of the country. And that's <laughs> when things go awry. And, um, you know, people say it has all kinds of, the dose isn't predictable. So, you know, you never really know what kind of effects yeah. you're going to feel. I don't understand why anyone would want to be high on an airplane it, as it's an unpredictable environment. I don't understand why you'd want to induce any sort of. They probably think it's going to help with their anxiety. Yeah. Honestly. The other way sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. They can yeah. have a paradoxical effect. Just yeah. like you can with basically any medication. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. That and also I find painkillers. I mean, mm. I don't know that they're on painkillers, but the behavior. I also used to work in mental health and substance abuse treatment. So I've seen some of these behaviors um coming out of places where they have a lot of surgeries people travel for surgery a lot oh wow they they go yep. there to get the dis discounted surgeries but they can't always afford necessarily to stay a week or yeah. two ever so they right. come back yep. and they're on medications and that's hard, harder to spot because there's you know a lot of you can yeah. talk about brazilian behind lifts that's when mm -hmm. you tend to see them. Yeah. yeah. And you have to remember those, air, and I may get the details wrong to correct me, but you know, air, you, you certainly want to be, wouldn't want to be in an airplane at 30,000 feet because the air is so thin you couldn't breathe. So they're pressurized cabins, but they're only pressurized to like, isn't it 8,000 feet? So it's still like being on top of a mountain. Yeah. You're not at mm -hmm. 30,000 feet, but the air in the cabin is still very dry, very thin. So if you have respiratory problems, yeah. you're going to have trouble if you're on, um, opiates or something and your respirations are, are depressed, you're not getting as much oxygen with every breath in. Um, people just think it's being like being on the ground when you're in a plane because it's comfortable and you're in a chair. And, but it's, it's like being on top of a couple of mountains, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Also I had that issue. Sorry. Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, I, I do mission trips to Thailand quite often. And um, a lot of people go, Thailand is one of the number one countries that people go to get surgeries in. And so there was somebody, there was multiple people that were bandaged up or 
you know, back braces or things like that on our flight from Bangkok to Tokyo. And it was like, well, the walking wounded, like I thought I was in a PACU. Um, And there was this, yeah, seriously, there was this one person that literally was trying to go to the restroom and these tiny, small um, Thai flight attendants who were like literally a quarter of his size um, were trying to like help. And um, I ended up getting up and, and making sure this individual did not face plant because he oh my gosh. was most likely under the influence of so many pain medications plus the fact that it the surgery that it looked like they had had um was orthopedic in nature and um so like they they couldn't they could barely make it down the whole the aisle i was just like that is such a a recipe for disaster. I told the guy though, I was like, I cannot get you, I cannot get you up and down off of the, the toilet. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not, not doing they don't it. Pay me like, up. I'm not, yeah. yeah, they do not. I'm not being paid for this. And I also don't want to like mess up my back. Cause yeah, there's that's no room in that. that. You. We have to assist them in getting to the laboratory, but we don't have to assist them inside of the laboratory. And it's always interesting, interesting when new policies come up because you, that means it's occurred and yeah. so written into practice. And um, and that's why now um, another policy that's come up in the last 10 years has been if you require substantial support, you cannot travel alone. Mm-hmm. Because we've mm. had cases where, you know, people from other countries are maybe flying their grandmother, great grandmother back to the States and alone, and they really shouldn't be flying alone. And then issues arise. Mm. Um, so now we, we do have to assess whether or not a patient or sorry, a passenger is able to care for themselves to the best of their ability without needing support during a flight and for the entire duration of the flight. Yeah. I will have you know, too, you talked about pas- uh, pa- passengers not being allowed onto the plane. Um, I had the good fortune of working at the airport, at the hospital ER that's closest to SFO. So when the gate agents win, <clears throat> or when the flight attendants win and they don't let them on the plane, people are upset and drunk people when they're upset, you know. Um, sometimes they lash out and they'll stomp around the the uh, airport and make threats or whatever. So then they put them on a fifty one fifty. They throw them in the back of an ambulance and they bring them to me, who's busy taking care of the baby with the fever, the guy who had a stroke, and the woman who's got vaginal bleeding. And now I got to babysit a two hundred and fifty pound two year old who's going. I got to get to the airport. They get, I'm like down, and so not my favorite patients to take care of. I would take care of them if that was my only patient. I, I do that. That's part of my job. But when I've got other things to do, and then this, um, it is, and, and all he asked, they just need to sober up. I don't really have anything to offer them. Um, but we got plenty of that for people that um, would have like pain medication. Then they have a drink or two at the bar in the airport, mm-hmm. you know, before they on the plane. And then they'd be obtundent. And they're like trying to wake them up. It's like, it's time to board the plane. Get up. We're not going to carry your ass onto the plane. Like, wow, this person's not really waking up. So I, I always tell people, look, wait till you get on the plane to drink. If you're going to, if you're going to drink, drink on the plane. The advice is- <laughs> Just get on the Stay plane. Get drunk. Come on. Well, the whole alcohol thing is really a FAA responsibility here in America. Mm-hmm. And it's really ridiculous. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's dangerous. It's irresponsible. Uh, I mean, it's compl- and the way people are behaving, you know, I'm like, what happened to like, you know, the air marshals and, you know, I, I mean, the way I have seen people behave is just unbelievable. And flight attendants and, and the staff, you know, should not have to deal with that. The FAA, these airlines really need to crack down. I'm um, again, it's zero tolerance on that behavior is a choice. And I agree if they show any, any sign that they're going to right. misbehave on board, just kick them off. Cause you're going to be locked in a, in a metal tube, 30,000 feet above the air 
with these people and you can't just leave and you just can't ask mm -hmm. them to leave. You are stuck together until yeah. the pilot finds a place to well, put you Well, even like the pre-boarding behavior. I mean, you know, we're just people exactly. acting That's what I'm ridiculous, you know, don't let them on the plane. And because it's, it's a safety issue. I mean, it, well, it trains as well, like any, anywhere yeah. where you're actually just stuck. I mean, people have to be, the alcohol's a problem in bars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so <laughs> alcohol's a problem in bars. It's a problem everywhere. But I mean, I just think there should be a system where it's like, okay, you've got to show your boarding pass. What time are you boarding? And there's some way that the number of drinks you've had in the airport is tracked. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you know there those... needs to be some system. And then because honestly, I, it's so dangerous for, it's dangerous for, you know, the flight itself. It's dangerous for passengers. I've sat next to drunk people, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, you know, I had my experience getting punched on the plane and on the other Air France, the prior to the last Air France flight, um, you know, and it's, and, be, and also, you know, when you're flying internationally, there's all different rules and laws and regs and, you know, if you're incoming from international, like they don't care. They don't, they just like want to dump you off. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with any of it because it's not their country. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They're just like, great, get off the plane. But there really should be a little more regulation on that for the safety of, of the flight attendants. Because mm -hmm. again, all of these things lead to burnout. All of these things lead to oh, dissatisfaction yeah. with the job. It leads to a miserable experience for passengers. And it's just flat out dangerous. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, and I'm curious too, just on the question of like, you know, cause I'm thinking, I'm like all the things you have to like click, right. When you are booking your flight and you know, they're again, just like hospitals, I think there should be a contract of behavior. Oh, I no. think there is. Oh. There? No. Somewhere. Well, I think it's like you, by agreeing, you agree to terms of service, yeah. but I think yeah. in there, it's not explicit. In the fine print. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm with Irene. I think you shouldn't be able to have alcohol on a plane. Yeah, like, no. I think that's weird. Like, if you can't. Well, go... there's some people that can't fly unless they have a little. I mean, fear of flying. I mean, Nick. Well, that's oh, for too sure. bad. They more. shouldn't fly then. There's people that I. You know what? They shouldn't fly then. Figure yeah. it or out. Or we need you to figure a... out flying how to be more liberal with is medicine not a... to help with that. Yeah. Yeah, flying is not a right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm, I may be anxious in a car. Do I get to take a drink before I get behind the wheel? No, mm -hmm. I don't. You know, yeah. I mean, there's we deal with it. You figure it out or you adapt. You don't have a right to just do whatever, you know, you want um, and to am ameliorate whatever symptom you're feeling and to whatever consequence there might be to other people or to yourself. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, again, all those planes that get diverted because we don't know the secondary causes of all those things on the list. Right. But that's all time. That's money. That's people missing other flights that they may not be reimbursed for cruises, whatever it might be. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, you know, yeah, figure it out. You do not have a right to travel. Yeah. And yeah, people are just going to be so much more unpleasant. There were a bunch of drunk people on that plane too, because it was Super Bowl Sunday. We were heading into Philadelphia. Philadelphia was playing in the Super Bowl. The pilot literally had to send someone like had to come on over the loudspeaker and like try to stop a fight that was happening in the back of the plane earlier from like they were watching it and like they were fighting. It was like, I felt so bad for these poor <laughs> flight attendants. I mean, we're, like, we're literally just like, get me <laughs> off. Yeah, it's the same, like it's just, the same thing like, you know, in your Mardi Gras flights or Carnival no. or, or Gay Pride, for example, mm -hmm. or, you know. I, well, gay Pride flights are fun, though. I flew to Savannah, uh, what was it, for last year in March for um, St. Patrick's Day, which was like the third busiest St. Patrick's Day parade in the country, which I did not mm -hmm. know. Uh, um, you know, and there's public drinking is perfectly fine in Savannah. I was miserable. I mean, I was having fun with my friends, but I was completely miserable and almost got into about 20 fist fights walking the streets of Savannah with drunk people. Because I'm like, I do not even look at me sideways. Don't even think that thought. Don't talk to me. Don't stare at me in the restaurant. Don't ask me my a man or a woman. Don't no. Just go straight to jail. Zero. Pasco. <laughs> straight to jail. Straight to zero jail. tolerance. Right. Yeah. I'm like, you know, it's just, it's just to me, it's just gross. I mean, it's just, it's so unnecessary. There's a lot of unknown factors. Like, let's just eliminate one of them. Can't have this while you're on the yeah. plane. Okay. Liz's during world, no. COVID, during the heights of COVID, especially when masking was still required, some airlines didn't allow alcohol on board at all. And that was a big source of contention with their passengers. And I know my airline, they, we serve alcohol on the ground before we even push back from the gate, which is a big, wow. 
yeah, many of us had just kind of flat out refused, especially in the yeah. Now, you know, now we comply, we do what we have to, to keep our jobs. But at the same time, it's what are we encouraging? Mm -hmm. Right. And the truth is we are encouraging a lot of um, questionable behavior. We're mm -hmm. putting mm -hmm. people in awkward situations too, mm -hmm. where we're flying them with alcohol. Yeah. And we're saying, but try to keep it together. And the first thing I did last week when I looked at my schedule was to check which teams were in the Super Bowl and am I flying to those cities? And I went, Whew, thank God. No. Not. Yeah. yeah. These poor people looked like they were just like, are you? No. And Irene, yeah, it's not like shame on you for drinking. No, it's not that at all. Like I am, I mean, I think everyone probably knows I'm all about that, but just not on a tube, yeah. maybe flying through the air where you can't yeah. leave or kick the person out is very unfrowned upon, like very, very frowned upon to just kick them out. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, and friends, what, I'm just curious if there's, sorry. Thanks for being here. I'm glad thanks. you can put IVs in people in airplanes. You're very impressive. <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining bye. us <laughs> yeah thanks guys bye I just that, it's about... real... oh go ahead scott go ahead i was just gonna say speaking of that it is a real challenge you know to be called upon to do that um especially and, and you adrian you bring up a good point you know you're in the air you're like well we don't really need to, to put the plane down but now i've got like three hours with this person and i don't know what their heart rhythm is and i don't know what their blood pressure is because it's loud in here and all this kind of stuff and like I said, with the blood pressure, there's a few ways around it. Um, but I thought we could brainstorm, like we we're all on a plane together, like we're all on Air France going to Oklahoma, <laughs> or maybe coming from Oklahoma. And we have a patient that goes down, Nick's the, you know, we're, Nick's working, it's on Nick's flight. And are there any, anybody can help a patient, any providers, any healthcare professionals, and the four of us jump up because we're so anxious. <clears throat> and we're faced with the situation. Let's, let's come up with some ways that we might deal with the situation when we're not, you know, in our element where we don't have all the equipment. And the, the first suggestion I was going to make was, okay, we don't have, you know, well, the blood pressure thing, we don't have a cardiac monitor, but we can feel pulses. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can check for irregularity um, and strength. So that tells us something that also tells us about, about blood pressure. Um, it's kind of the across the room what we call an across the room assessment when someone is first comes to the ER before they even approach the triage desk, are they walking? Are they pale? Do they look like they know what they're going, you know, what they're doing or are they kind of dazed and confused? Um, is their skin warm and, uh, or is it cold and clammy or is it warm and dry? Those kinds of things give us more information than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. So we know about, you know, their autonomic nervous system. We know about their cardiovascular system the respiratory system, we can try to listen to lung sounds, but we can also palpate for fremitus. And, and if it sounds like, you know, if they're really full of fluid, we're also going to feel as well as hear that. Anybody else want to talk about maybe, and, and Chad, maybe talk about how you assess a pregnant woman without your fancy equipment? Um, well, or anybody let's... else about, about any other? So well, and let, I was let's just going to add... Back when half... Go ahead. These are the most common, just so everyone has a frame of reference of what we're kind of like, what are the most common things you would see on a flight in terms of emergencies? Um, syncope or pre-syncope, so someone fainting or feeling like they're going to faint, respiratory symptoms, I can't breathe, nausea or vomiting, uh, cardiac symptoms, and then seizures. Uh, Nick, does that seem like a fairly accurate representation of yeah. how people yeah, try to misbehave? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that's kind of what we're looking at. Okay, Chad, go ahead. I cut you off. Um, that's all right. So one half a step back from what Scott said, um, if there's more than one person on the plane, we need to establish who's who. Mm -hmm. If this fellow says, steps up, says, I'm a doctor, but he's a psychiatrist, he's not <laughs> going to be much help. He's, yeah. He can talk the patient through it. Or if, um, I'm an ophthalmologist. Okay, you're not much help in this situation. Mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but if Scott steps up, says, I'm an emergency nurse, you're on. Yep. For sure. If you got if you got a pregnant woman and it's me and Scott, I think Scott would be a presence of mind enough to step back and say you're in the driver's seat. So first, we need to establish who's who. It's a bold um, claim, yeah. Chad. It's, it's kind of like in a code when you have a code blue in a, in a hospital. It's always okay. Who's the captain? Sometimes who's in charge. We actually have like a cap that the captain wears. So when you're looking around the room, it's like the person who's wearing that ball cap of it's blue or red or yellow or whatever. That's the person who's giving the orders. Otherwise, you've got orders coming from all directions, and we can't have that. We need, need to organize ourselves. And you know, the, Nick, and, who and decides? Ophthalmologist might have done a, a rotation in the ER and, and really 
yeah, that's not that's what you do every day, but they still might be better than me, you know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, you're right. We would have to talk about it and kind of. Yeah, we usually will take one or two medical volunteers and we do, we ask what their specialty is. So like okay. the EMTs are always great because they know a little bit of uh -huh. everything. We had a nurse practitioner recently and I was like, nurse Liz. Um, but um, so yeah, we do want to know what your specialties are. We're not going to ask you for credentials or anything like that right up front because there mm -hmm. have been issues with that in the past where mm -hmm. people haven't been believed and have been denied the ability to treat. So mm -hmm. we are just thankful that anyone is stepping up. Uh, and we do have um, a list that we go through. It's our medical assistance form. And we start from the top with, you know, name, age, gender. And then we go to those that primary survey, the secondary survey. And, you know, the most important stuff up top down to the most, uh, the stuff that's the lowest priority down at the bottom. But um, that way, when we have a nervous volunteer stepping up, we can already kind of start having got, gathered that information and can provide it to you. And we will stay with you all the way through the end of the process. Because I know oh, that that's interesting. An issue in the past where people have been yeah. like, doctors here, we're stepping back. But yeah, yeah we're going to be right there with you the whole time. Um, even if we have to land sitting on the ground, because that happens too sometimes, you know, sometimes uh -huh. you can't reposition a, pa a passenger. Um, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I can say, for those of you that don't know, um, EMTs, emergency <laughs> medical technicians, um, are they employed on ambulances? You know what you know what they are. And then paramedics, <clears throat> I think everyone knows, are a kind of a step up. I went through EMT training after I became a nurse. I was thinking I want to be a flight nurse. So I want to be like a paramedic, RN, whatever. And it was something to do. So I got trained as an EMT. They're basically first aid specialists. God bless them for the work that mm -hmm. they do, but they can put oxygen on you and bandage your boo-boo and take you to the hospital. That's about it. Paramedics, there's a huge leap then to the paramedics. They have to know vasopressors. They have to know all about hemodynamics. They have to know all about all these meds. I mean, um, so paramedics, meds. The paramedic meds is really who you would. Yeah, they know yeah. how to operate. To show up on your plane. <laughs> yeah. 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 And multiple professionals that step up i've seen they know how to work together you know you guys know who knows what and you guys sort it out amongst yourselves and you also know when to take a, a back seat and say all right we have enough and i'm just gonna sit down and you know i'm here if you need me and, mm -hmm. and that's really important too because even the flight attendant sometimes i have to say we don't all need to be involved <laughs> you uh -huh. stay back yeah. there and talk to the captain you know mm -hmm. It's like a code um, in the hospital. Yeah. Everyone's like, I yeah. must be involved. And you're like, mm. Yeah, that was me. No. I was a transporter at the door going, does anyone need help? They're like, we don't really need a transporter. In the I've got flushes. Like, okay, <laughs> what can I do? Yeah. I I How useful is an AED in just monitoring cardiac rhythms? Because we do have AEDs on board all aircrafts. And I mean, as long as we're not shocking anyone, how useful are they? Not well, much. depends on two say. things. If it doesn't have a screen to show the rhythm, and is there somebody there to interpret that rhythm? So yeah, they usually have a screen. Through it, they they will not say much. Shock advised or not? And I don't. Okay, yeah. so there's no like screen on it. Yeah. And I don't know how long the battery is on that. They're used. They're supposed to be used till EMS comes, right? So I don't oh. think you can use it for five, four, or three, four hours till we get to Kansas City. Um, well, and what they you could leave it on, and they will monitor for a shockable rhythm. So there's. I don't know, half a dozen, dozen different types of heart rhythms. And a few of them might get fixed if you shock them. The rest don't. All it tells you is, is it one of those or is it not one of those? So it's a limited, it, you know, if you're not sure. Um, if they're awake, it's not one of those, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but I would, I'd start, I just like you said, primary, secondary survey, airway, breathing, circulation. Make sure they're breathing. Give them some oxygen because we're at altitude. So give them some oxygen. Um, just so you know, when they get down, this was something interesting I learned. Um, if you give them like high flow oxygen and they're at altitude, when they come back down, when the atm atmospheric pressure is lower, the, um, it, the oxygen types, you know, the, the middle ear is an air filled space and it has a lot of oxygen in it because you've been breathing that. Um, that will get absorbed by the body and you'll actually have a very negative pressure in the ear. So you can get um, what's called barotitis media. Ugh. And that's because you've had high flow oxygen at altitude. They come down, 
the oxygen kind of gets absorbed into the tissues and there's that negative, you get a lot. So you need to make sure they can pop their ears and, and be, uh, be alert for that. I guess if it gets really bad, they actually will, you know, pierce the temper, the, the eardrum or something. But yeah, you have to think about the pressures, you know, at different altitudes. So I think everybody could probably use oxygen, try to calm them down, get a history. Um, and then if they're pregnant, Mr. Midwife, what do you want to, what do you, what are you going to check out? Well, I'm going to check things differently than other people would. Um, how far apart are the contractions? Can you walk through them? Can you talk through them? Can you breathe through them? Are you, you know, if you're just like, <sighs> as contraction versus you're grabbing your husband, you're threatening to divorce him or murder him right here on the plane. That's a different <laughs> story. And literally I, I tell my patients when your demeanor changes, Go to the hospital. If you still love your husband, stay home. If uh -huh. you hate him <laughs> and threatening to kill him, get in the car and start driving. Mm -hmm. And so there's a demeanor thing there. Um, I'm going to take a peek, see if anything's coming out. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to make sure I have gloves on. Um, that list of things that they carry on planes, they do have bandages. I don't see cord clamps. No, they have none of see, that on there. Well, you have an OB kit, don't you? Don't you have a, a an a OB kit, Nick? That wasn't on that list, but I I thought I'd read that they're always uh, it's called an out of sepsis kit. In the I'm not ER. sure. I'm not sure. Out of asepsis. That's it. I would have. I don't know if there is one. It, it's not required by the FAA. So like some your airplane can decide, like your airline can decide they're going to go above and beyond and carry extra things. So like the flight that I was on had extra things, which I didn't know until, you know, after, and I'm looking through the list of like what was required. And I was like, Oh wow. We had a lot of things that weren't on the list, but that's why people are asking for them to update the list. Cause the list is not very extensive and it involves a lot of it could be a lot better. You know, there should be an EpiPen on board. We should have Narcan available um, for the people who are coming back from the absolutely. planes where they're probably on opioids. Like we shouldn't rely on an emergency room nurse to happen to have this who right. happens to be on the plane. You know what I mean? Like that's just, that's bad. Or other passengers. In my yeah, children, what would you do? If you don't, if you don't have your OB, uh, we, we called it an out of a sepsis basin and we kept it at uh -huh. triage. So if someone delivered in the driveway, we could grab that. It had the basics in it, but if it didn't, you don't have a cord clamp. What do you do? What is there something that's so, on that list you could use as a substitute or. So how would there's you a couple of things that, that I would do. Um, obviously get whatever towels you can get, give me a pair of gloves, get this kid delivered, leave the cord attached placenta is delivered usually by the time that happens everything's stopped you can leave the placenta attached for quite some time actually days actually um and so i'm okay leaving that thing attached until we land and, and can get her to a hospital what i'm more concerned about is the bleeding if she decides to bleed i need something like methogen or cytotec um misoprostol um anything like that to clamp her down in the absence of that what I can do is take a piece of the cord, take a small piece of the cord, cut it, stick it between her cheek and her cheek and gum, and that will provide enough pitocin to clamp her down. Hopefully. That's, but if I, That's exactly what I was but, hoping you'd say. Nick, your I'm face leaving, is my, my feelings inside. You're like, look, may I never need if, to do that. Okay. Like if, <laughs> if I'm leaving, if I'm leaving the cord attached because I don't have cord clamps. I guess I can wait for the for the 30 seconds it takes for that cord to quit pulsating. As soon as it pulse, quits pulsating, I'm okay. I can cut, cut, and I don't necessarily need a clamp. It's more of a decoration. But I was thinking you have IV the, tubing there. If you've got extra IV tubing, you cut a section of that. Yeah. Adrian, Adrian says shoelace. Shoelace or something. Mm -hmm. I don't like using those aseptic things, but in no. a pinch, I can always give antibiotics later. So, right, yeah, right. Anything like that. And, I don't yeah, like giving birth on a plane. None of well, us. Yeah. Right, we're, we're, right. we're past that way. <laughs> <laughs> the baby's here. The baby's here. We're past that. So, yeah. But I didn't know that about the um, the pitocin in the cord. Yeah, you just just a little piece, like maybe to your first knuckle mm -hmm. on your pinky, just a small piece, stick it between her cheek and gum, and that provides enough pitocin. What I would have thought is her, at least and it'll clamp her down. 
This is what not about- what you can say on the internet now because Chad, there's gonna be a whole bunch of people on TikTok now being like, I oh, saw God. when you give birth, <laughs> you should like get a knuckle length of your cord and just gnaw down on it and get a little You don't have to gnaw down on it, just stick it in there. It's it's <laughs> something you learn from the old midwives that work with the Amish. This is if you started a trend, that they do. We blame you. These are the tricks that they do. <laughs> And just so disclaimer, everybody, nothing here on this show is to be construed as medical advice, health advice. Absolutely this is all for not. entertainment purposes only. Thank you. Generally, <laughs> those are just my experiences and my opinion. I would have thought about um, just massaging the uterus, right? Doesn't that also help it to clamp that down? You, you can do that. I don't know how that affects sometimes, it. Sometimes, it, sometimes they bleed through it. Hmm. So, yeah. But otherwise, keep the baby warm, put it skin to skin, and... Yep, it's okay I, to leave uh, the cord attached. I learned something today. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll I'll leave I'll, I'll put it right down mom's shirt if mom's not available. She's passed out something. Dad sitting right there. I'll put it right down dad's shirt, skin to skin with dad. That works too. Keep the airway clear. All that good stuff. My mm-hmm. nightmare. But now we know a little bit more than we did twenty minutes ago, right? I mean, I we don't do. feel like I have to go deliver a baby in a plane now, but. I mean, let's not do this. <laughs> let's not do this. <laughs> but, you know, and, yeah. and seizure. I've, I've, I've talked about seizures so many times, different places that, you know, you know that it's scary to watch. I tell patients this, like if you ever see a, a kid with a seizure or, or an adult for that matter, it's scary. It's dramatic. Um, and it does look like it does on TV, unlike the mm-hmm. defibrillation, which looks like even though they flop around on TV, a seizure is pretty dramatic. And people freak out. If you ever notice a nurse, though, what it, all the nurses do as soon as someone seizes in front of them, flip them over. Mm-hmm. No, we start timing it. There's no, no there's Time nothing it. to do. As long as they're not going to hit their head against something, if they're already on the ground, let's just time it to see because the doctor first thing they're going to ask when they come in the room is how long have they been seizing for. And we, you know, we need to we need to know that. But um, mm-hmm. there's not much they're going to breathe irregularly. We turn them on their side so that they vomit out of their body and not into their lungs. Um, and you do document. Like, and I document. did learn that too. You do document on a plane. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they were I, pretty are, much the. Are you documenting was or was somebody else doing it? The flight uh, flight attendant was the one. I they just said like what time it was. They said it's but like they were writing it down and they said time. They wrote it down and then they just wrote down whatever we did and they were kind of like would have me just say out loud what I was ever I was doing and then they just wrote it down and then sh- they handed me the piece of like um, towel like it was like a they were writing it on like a napkin type of thing, which is, I was like, Oh, it's just like the hospital. So I chart all my codes on. Um, and then we went down and then I got the paper too. Like you were talking about Nick, there was like a whole filled out. It didn't have like a lot on it because of the thing that had happened, but I took that down and we had a little powwow. The flight what? attendants have really good scribes, like really good help. Yeah. Oh, they were like the See, best. I have never like, seen this happen ever on a flight with a medical emergency where there's somebody yes. taking notes I've never seen a bag come out. Um, I got to like rethink my flying well, options. Yeah, there's a bag right behind first class, as I've learned. And if they pull it out, just get ready. I mean, I've seen yeah. the bag. I've seen Hi. the bag up there. Put your I earphones, like, both of them in, where it is. fall into the bottom of your seat and pray that someone else stands up before you Yeah, go. we have God, a different, two different bags. The clear bag is the, the vomit bag, the, you know, that's. That's not a big deal. The red bag is up a level. And once you see the black bag, it's going down. We had a black bag. Oh, wow. There was a lot of bags. They came out, I they think- pulled all of them. They just started yanking all of the things out. And I was like, oh, no. Oh. It's like <laughs> your now mobile crash car, right? Bag. We keep that one behind the lock and key because that has, that's the stuff we have to have a, a licensed medical professional's authorization to go into. That's got mm-hmm. the medication. I've heard that. They will say, okay, I've got, here's your first aid kit. Are you an actual licensed professional? Can, and then I've heard like, you have to show them your license and then they'll open that bag. They just made me swear. I, when they but found it, they said, are you, do you have prescribing authority? And I said, in the United States. And I said, yes. I think they don't go like, I don't, okay, let me check nurse this for your license. I don't have time to pull up nurses. <laughs> I don't yeah, have to pull up There was some controversy a few years ago when someone, you know, they didn't have their credentials on them or I don't know mm-hmm. if you guys carry around a license or what. Mm-hmm. But um, and she was a woman of color and they gave her a hard time. And so I think out of that comes now we just yep. allow you to swear and attest that you are a licensed medical provider. Yeah. 
Yep. And so what not, if you hadn't been a prescriber though? What, so what would then the they would have said what to next? give? Cause then they, I gotcha. think would have said what to give. Cause what happened was I said, they said who, like I had to tell the person on the, like the little headset, what I was like, I'm a nurse, family nurse practitioner. And they said, okay, are you licensed to prescribe in the United States? And I said, yes, I let them know. I do not have a DEA number. And they said, it is okay. Cause a DEA number would let you prescribe. I, and I said, I think I'm going to have to give, like, what if I have to give something that's a controlled substance and you need a DA number for that? And they said, that is fine. You do not need one. Um, and they said, like, since you are a, like, you can prescribe, you may go, you may proceed at your own like volition or something. And then like, and then he said, I just need you to swear under blah, 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 somewhere. I don't even remember what they said, like that you are who you say you are and could prove it if required. Gotcha. Like, oh, interesting. Okay. Unfortunately, yes. And I mean, I don't know, like to me right now, also in this day and age, right, when we have so much great like Bluetooth technology for heart heart monitoring and vital signs, it really, you know, the airlines really should step up and have some remote monitoring. So you can have an AED that can transmit, you know, Bluetooth to, you know, a phone that mm -hmm. whatever, or some device that can also mm -hmm. be transmitting all, all the data, right? Yeah. To to either just somebody there on board who can then send it to somebody else or just read it or know it. But there's really no reason we lost Scott. Um, so, you know, that really, uh, let's just, let's advocate for the airlines to step up that game because remote monitoring, there's so much equipment out there and it's Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, even just to have that capability to see on a longer flight, what is somebody's heart rhythm? I mean, I'm a cardiac nurse. I, I'm all about like, What's that rhythm? I want to know what's going on with that person's heart and are they perfusing? Because that's going to make a big difference if I can't assess anything else otherwise. You know, we mm -hmm. want to know is that person, what's their blood pressure? Are they perfusing? And, you know, are there changes in, in the heart rhythm? And if you have somebody remotely then who can see that also, that's a huge advantage. Just a yeah. huge, huge advantage. Yeah. And, and I so think I, and there's a lot of, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I think it was shocking to me how much improvement there could be. You know what I mean? Like, cause I assume right. there's going to be a glucometer. There's going to be a manual blood yeah. pressure cuff. There's going to be an EpiPen. Glucagon is going to be available. Right. Like, you know what I mean? That right. I can just pick up and stab and not have to be like, okay, let right. me just pull up the, like start an IV, use this vial. I was yeah. like, it would also be so much more helpful. Like other people could be so much more helpful if there was literally just something that, you know, like if you could label it and be like, like anaphylaxis, okay, great. Stab with this low blood sugar, right. stab with it. You know what I mean? Like, right. There's so much easier ways, but the thing that like blew my mind was the Narcan it, thing. And I found like flight attendants, yeah. the association of flight attendants also are like mad about it and are like, um, hello, like, can, can we please yeah. maybe have this? <laughs> That'd Narcan be great. And, right. and I'd argue also Romazicon you want on there something like benzoid. yeah yeah right. exactly because that's the a benzos mess. right it's probably a high utilization on benzos as well and yeah i mean there's well, just so many things romance. yeah and we didn't even talk about like being on planes medical emergencies at sea hey we could talk about oh. blood transfusions on cruise ships that's always super fun it's vein to vein baby and every staff on the on the on the boat on a ship has to be a donor. They're required. What? You hope they're clean. You, you are required clean. when you work on a ship. I did not know and that. Every, That's wild. Because again, most cruise ships, their ports of call are not in the United States or anywhere really. They're always some dodgy place that has no rules and regulations <laughs> or labor laws. So they can basically be like, you are our indentured servant on this ship. Yeah. Yeah. It's arm oh. to arm. You My. just get like, you're, and everybody gets typing crossed. Um, and, and I don't know of any exception on any uh, cruise ship that on that on that rule. That's horrifying. Wow. That doesn't happen on yeah. planes. Doesn't <laughs> happen on planes. I don't know anywhere else that that happens, actually, other than on cruise ships. But yeah, because well, if you think about it, you are really out in the middle, you know, of nowhere and you can't really get anywhere fast. Um, so, yeah, if, if I got to transfuse you on a plane, you got bigger problems. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a very bad bigger day. problems. But I think that definitely the airlines could step up their commitment to passenger safety 
And, you know, it's awesome how you guys are trained, Nick. But, you know, also I was reading something about like in Russia, they have like some other kind of category, like how the difference is in international airlines, because medicine, a, an MD is kind of a universal standard versus nursing. An RN, some countries don't even have RNs. Uh, many countries don't have NPs. I mean, that's pretty much a United States kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's like something else in Russia. I can't remember what it was called in that LinkedIn article um, I shared. Yes. And started with an F, you know, something did it. F is like Felshun or something, um, yeah. or something, you know. So, like, again, it depends on what that recognition factor is. <laughs> and then is the staff really going to be listed? Like, on that Air France flight I was in, like, the staff were completely the opposite of how you're explaining, Nick. I mean, completely mm -hmm. the opposite. I mean, they were just like, they waited a long time. I saw the guy drop. I was like, I don't see him getting up. Like, that's weird. Like, he just dropped. And then it was like, because he was like right on the left of my aisle, off the middle aisle. And, you know, and then it was like kind of a, a long time. I mean, minutes, you know, for me. I was like, we're we all just going to fly like this. He's going to be down in the aisle, you know? And then, <laughs> then it's like, then they do Step the announcement. Then we get the announcement. I like raise my hand. That takes a little bit of time before they like figure, you know, I don't know. It just took, everything took a long time. And they make it all the way around the plane over to that side. And they're like, no, 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 everything's okay. Are you sure? He doesn't really look okay. The guy's still down. And, and of course they all speak French and I needed Nick. And um, then, you know, no, no, I'm, yeah, everything's fine. I'm like, I'm not seeing this guy move of his own volition or communicate, but then I couldn't really see him very well. Okay, great. I walk all the way back because I was just like, well, they're not even going to let me to this guy. Walk all the way back around, sit down. Then is there a medical professional on the plane? Like, you know, FFS, what is going on on this plane? <laughs> this is Air France, you know, like, hello, Delta partner. Hello, Delta. Um, so I get up, you know, and I go to stand up, but then a woman like four or five rows behind me so she had been like, obviously not standing up the first round. So yeah. Just for point of reference. She did not make any notation of herself. She so was the Liz on this flight. She was right. Okay. She was the, praying she to was, God. Adrian stood up. <laughs> she was like, yeah. So I stand up and then she said, she's an ER nurse, you know, like something. <laughs> and I was like, I go. And, I, and so again, like you said, Nick, I was like, okay, you got this. Like, are you good? You, you want to handle this? I'm right here. Just let me know. And I'll come help you if you need, um, you know, because I just felt like the flight attendants were just like, they just wanted to control like the environment and act like nothing was going on. Meanwhile, now like 10 minutes had passed and the guy was still down and unconscious. Yikes. You know, and I don't even know whatever really happened, yeah. you know, but it just, and because he was young. So again, when somebody's younger and that happens, then you're really concerned because then mm -hmm. you're just thinking like, They've just had like a total stroke or they've just had like a PE and they're dead or mm -hmm. they've had, you know, like cardiac, you know, some they've just had some cardiac event. And, you know, you're just thinking kind of the worst when people are really younger and, and not visibly appearing inebriated. Um, but, yeah, that was, you know. Yeah. And I've got a lot of nurse Scott in me where like, I know when a medical emergency happens, I'm just like, all right, let's do it. Cause I, uh -huh. one of the hardest parts of my jobs is the boredom and the lengthy, there's nothing to do at a certain point. Mm -hmm. so, like when I actually get to do my job, I, I love it. And uh, yeah, but that's true. Not everybody has that same outlook. A lot of people do want to just run the other way. Um, and also I, I just, how flight attendants used to be nurses, I wish that my airline had some sort of, a, I wish they would pay for me to go to nursing school because then it would be a no brainer. I don't think yeah. you should have to pay to become a nurse. I mean, I, of course you should, but like we have a nursing crisis, like yeah. somebody step in and yeah. I've already got that, you know, like, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I wish the airlines would offer a level of training beyond and above the base level. And just like we have, French language translators, mm -hmm. uh, medical, mid-level something on mm -hmm. board. There could be yeah. a level of qualification, and I would gladly volunteer. Yeah, to do that. yeah. Because it, it is makes sense sometimes when like it does. Thing that made me want to kind of pursue nursing was like 
when these situations would arise, I really, really wanted to know what to do. And I yeah. didn't know exactly what to do. And it was frustrating. And I was mm-hmm. like, I want to know, like Scott, when I see a car accident, I want to be the person who knows you get over there. You get over there. Yeah. How do you make the decision to call someone up, like to make the announcement? Like, Hey, can you come up versus like, I think I can handle this. So I would say anything beyond, um, anxiety, Yeah. Anything beyond anxiety, when I'm talking about a loss of consciousness and things like Mm -hmm. that, that's when I want to page for medical assistance. But I also want to keep it because I've had instances where I've told, you know, newer flight attendants, nope, we're not escalating this. This is not Mm -hmm. something to be escalate. You're just going to throw everyone into a clinic. Um, So anything really beyond anxiety, Mm -hmm. anything talking about a blood sugar, anything internal. I, then, mm-hmm. then I want someone involved just to at least monitor, you yeah. know, cause I'll give an orange juice. I know how to do that. Of course. Yeah. But at the same time, it's in everyone's best interest to mm-hmm. have somebody who can just do a, a cross check and let me mm-hmm. know we're okay to continue flying because yeah. the truth is the airline <laughs> will continue to fly at all costs because that is our number one priority mm-hmm. Get planes out on time every time. And, you know, we hope everyone arrives in good health. Yeah. But if someone puts their foot down and says, we need to stop, we need to pause, then they're just going to keep going. So there has to be these people involved. And hopefully they speak up. To yeah. Say, we got to take a little time out. We need to take Yeah. A- yeah. Now, now, is, that the to call? Do that? is that the call of the chief? Uh, attendant or chief stew. Um, so it call. can be any at my airline. This is since COVID. It we've employed something called like a safety timeout, and mm-hmm. they say they say we're all empowered to enforce one at any time. Um, and I do believe that that's true. It, but what it it takes um, a certain degree of confidence to, to really put your foot down. I've been oh, for sure years I'm at the point where I don't really care and so I'm just like no we're not going yeah um when I was newer even in the last several years I have allowed things to happen that shouldn't have happened because I wanted to be nice you Mm -hmm. know oh yeah I'm over that now Mm -hmm. so yeah um, once you get thrown up on you're Mm -hmm. over that yeah real quick well Nick you have a bright future ahead of you because if you become Mm -hmm. an RN and then also with your experience then you can work for actually private flights and make a lot of money. Uh, I saw I've do. known some arts res- I've known respiratory therapists and nurses who did that, who were flight attendants or both. They moonlighted, um, and then they did private flights. And yeah, yeah big big you bucks. Got these former nurses. It's so funny when I go to the doctor and I talk to the nurse or the MA. They're always like, "Oh, I want to be a flight attendant." I was like. We're, we want to be you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just switch. Program. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and if, if you've been thrown up on Nick, you're qualified to be a nurse. That's what that, that, that does qualify you. you. That was the day because it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> was and it wasn't that bad. You're like, eh, okay. Yeah. That's what I knew. I said, I can do hard things. <laughs> yeah. I can get puked on. Yes. This is fine. Yeah. You've already withstood like the verbal abuse and, you know, physical threats. So you've already yeah. got that part covered. You know, like I was watching, um, I, I don't know if it was a TikTok or what it was, but these bloggers, these young guys were asking this, this younger woman who's a nurse, well, what, what would you say to anybody wanting to be a nurse? And, and what was the best advice you could give? And she said, well, and, like super serious find a bunch of strangers on the street and just ask them to start like hurling insults at you uh-huh. and calling you names. And then it's like a gauntlet. Basically every day as a nurse in a hospital, you're walking like a hazing line mm-hmm. for 12 hours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And probably nurse- the same as a flight attendant. Yeah, You've said this before, uh-huh. nurse Adrian, cause I know you started like in your late thirties, right? And I'm 37 now. Yeah. And, um, That's how old I was when I started nursing school. Okay. Like nurses have been through things. Like I've been through things enough to be like, I think that's where I belong. I think I need to like permanently be in the hospital because that's my vibe these days. Yeah. A yeah. Lot of 
And with again, with your skills, I mean, you could be a flight nurse. I mean, you obviously are going to go to ICU or ER it's parent um, because, you know, you, you don't want to be bored. So ICU is, you know, ICU is where you want to you don't want to be bored, but you want to go deep. ER is where, you know, the adrenaline junkies and yeah. but, but don't go too deep. Yeah. <laughs> Hang out. No, you have no Things idea. you can't I, say on the Internet. Adrian. I'm sorry. Sorry. I know. No offense to anybody. Yeah. I was in the I ER yesterday. Like I was in the ER yesterday. <laughs> Are you feel? Oh, we'll have to talk about it. Even labor and okay. delivery sounds not so bad because I've heard OB nurse Chelsea talk about how, you know, that wasn't the specialty necessarily she saw herself going into. And then she mm -hmm. did a rotation and loved it. And I'm like, oh, open mind. Because I kind of want to do psych. Yeah. And people don't understand. Well, and, you know, oh, labor and delivery nurses, labor and delivery specifically, those nurses are critical care nurses although they do not ever get the credit for that, which drives me crazy. No. Um, but they are critical care nurses, you know, and yeah. And so there's a certain, you know, like OB is not my, my flavor at all, but there is certainly like a directing traffic kind of like take charge thing with L and D nurses. That is unlike any other kind of nurses I've met, you know, that's why they just stay in their own little area and nobody really interacts with them in the rest of the hospital. They just run their mm -hmm. little kingdom over there. And we don't, we're like, sure, just whatever you guys need. You know, we'll try <laughs> you and provide do, you. Just... We'll try you and provide you. Uh -huh. But they, basically the hospital, the people that nobody ever knows are like, if, unless you work there, are like the OB and the L&D nurses. Like for 30 years, you can work in a hospital. And you're like, I don't know. I didn't know that person. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, Just do what I say. Nobody gets hurt. Can't right. Go. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. We. I knew right away. And you'll know. You know, psych, every type of nursing has its own, you know, pros and cons. And but it's always the environment of care. The environment of care really defines the experience that the patients and the staff are going to have. Period. You know, it's going to be the environment of care. Or do you have enough support staff? Do you have the equipment? Do you have the right, you know, security? Do you have measures in place? You know, all of that really is going to determine your own satisfaction, you know, with nursing. That's why you didn't know you thing. were getting a pep talk. Here's your pep oh, talk. I was hoping for it though. I'm excited though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Every week. <laughs> well, now you're, you know, a union member, I'm assuming because flight attendants association, but yeah, so you'll go to I a don't union. give it away. Yeah. But so yeah, you'll want to be in a union hospital because that will I, be, yeah. that will be a big shock. That will be, uh, yeah. You'll immediately be a steward, a union steward, by the yeah. way, also. <laughs> yeah, and you can have a lot you. more room for growth too. Like, and you can leave your hospital and go to a different hospital. With flight attendants, we're stuck at the, you know, with seniority being the main thing there. You're really mm -hmm. stuck in the airline you're with, even if yeah. it starts to seem a little greener on the other side. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, and you can always, you know, keep that side hustle, right? Keep I'll, that side every hustle. Every flight attendant has a side hustle. Yeah, yeah. keep and those I flight benefits. Nursing, my main hustle. Yeah, there you go. Just flight benefits. You're right. Seriously. But, so another area that came up that we hadn't talked about that I had read in, in, in this other article was about not so much consent, but like actually. So if the patient is conscious to make sure that you introduce yourself and let them know who you are and what you're qualified, what your qualifications are. So that's really important for all the nurses or for any providers. But, you know, also a patient, a, a person, you know, a plane or wherever they can refuse treatment. Mm hmm. And there still may be a medical emergency happening. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, have you ever encountered that, Nick, or heard of that? Um, well, I know that I've refused treatment before because I was kind of like <laughs> lightheaded, right? And, you know, if we don't work, we don't get paid. It's not great. But, um, yeah. But um, so I was kind of lightheaded in the middle of the day. And I mentioned it to one of our supervisors. And they were like, oh, we got to bring the EMTs. We got to do the whole thing. I was like, are you kidding me? And he said, yeah, you said you were dizzy. So they brought all the things. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then they went away. And But they had to, per policy, because I said the words that you're not supposed to say, um, they had to come and I just got them to check my blood sugar and my do a pulse ox reading on me. But, um, yeah, I was just tired and hungry. So, but I've never had anyone, the people who refuse are usually intoxicated. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they have, a and there day. is, 
I want to bring up one other small thing. Um, there is a school of thought out there that we're covered, you know, if, if we do something, unless it's gross negligence, we're covered under the Good Samaritan Act. But any good lawyer um, who comes back wants to bite you in the butt. If you accept anything from the airline, a free ticket, a drink, anything, that could be construed as payment. And now you're under a different set of um, liabilities. So I would encourage people from what I've research I've done, don't accept a gift, not even a, an extra packet of pretzels. Just don't accept anything because that could be construed as payment and changes the patient caregiver relationship. Mm, That's the, yeah. an AMA article that warned about that, that was talking about yep. like, um, just be careful what you accept. Like, don't take money from like people who are offering it, you know, like don't take that because then it turns into a transactional. What if they send you something later? Weird type of vibe. What if they email you? Yeah, I don't know. Voucher? Like, I don't know. What I don't you do know. About, like the vouchers and stuff. I don't know. There was also the issue that in some areas internationally, you're, um, you're mandated to provide care. Oh so yeah, well, I there's think... some international laws mm -hmm. in some areas, and that was also in that LinkedIn article. That LinkedIn article was very good. Mm -hmm. um, the I references down below. Mm -hmm. were about ten, you know, somewhere a little bit older, but I don't really know how much that stuff changes. But it was really interesting about the mandated. So you could be in an area, even if you're American, you know, but you could be wherever. You could be in Vietnam, or I'm just making it up, mm -hmm. like some area, and then you're mandated under their laws, right? So it's like, what laws are covering you? Um, that one could also be something, you know, not that there would be any recourse in America for that, I guess, but you know, yeah. Cause here guess. you're not obligated to. So if yeah. you're ever curious about that, it's, you yeah. do have to volunteer. It's not considered negligence, even if you are qualified, but you can't, if you don't volunteer, they like you have an, they say like an ethical obligation to you mm -hmm. should, but you don't have to versus there are areas, like you said, that like you have to, um, yeah, so, I have a random, Oh, you guys wouldn't be required, but we, the flight crew would be required to administer oh, yeah. care until we can hand it over to a higher level of care. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, do, I personally don't know anybody in the healthcare field that's not going to step up and at least offer. So. Yeah, if I got up that aisle, you can get up the aisle. Well, right. unless you like care <laughs> care but who's just but like, again, please don't even make me suture. Like <laughs> you, you can. I mean, do not it. to scare people, but like, yeah. I'm sure we've all seen providers or some people be a little inebriated and mm -hmm. also be working. And so, you know, that's another thing, especially if you're on a plane or you're yourself or obviously traveling, you're on vacation. You know, you have to make that assessment. Like, have I had a drink? How am I? What is my? You know, am I impaired? And would that come back to me? And so that would be a totally legitimate reason to say, yeah, I don't want to participate, you know? Yeah. And I think, I'm you know, I I've, can't. yeah. And I think it's, you know, I've never had that experience uh, when I've seen, I've been a witness to this of anybody having some crazy bravado, but um, you know, it does happen sometimes. So you just want, it, humility is really important as, sure. a, as, as a medical pro and, professional of any kind. Yeah. And just accepting, yeah, I think accepting help and not getting yourself into a situation where you really don't know because you feel like you should know, but you don't know. You know what I mean? That doesn't, right. That's not going to help anybody. Um, Nick, I have a question. So I was thinking if I, normally I would be traveling with my two tiny humans. What, do you ever have a situation where like the only, like what if I was the only medical healthcare person on that plane, but I have two seatmates that are three and five does a flight attendant go and sit with them and like hang out with them? Or what do you do in that situation? Yeah. I mean, I definitely would. Uh, okay. and I'm pretty sure that on any flight crew, you would find a flight attendant who would be happy to do that. And in the I've case of my were, children, they would find a, another passenger who would be happy to sit with them. But that's a good point because um, that's one reason we don't allow adults to sit in an exit row if they're the sole caretaker for a child sitting in a mm -hmm. different row because their priority would be to the child and you mm -hmm. know we need it to be to evacuating the airplane but yeah um if you felt comfortable stepping away from your child because we would certainly verify that are you okay with us sitting with them yeah and, yeah and then okay. keep kind of checking in with you be like oh they're fine they just had a sprite oh they're fine you know yeah okay I was just curious because I was thinking that later I was like what if the girls were with me and like it was me and I have my like no one wants I mean, I mean <laughs> that's a lot but that makes sense okay so that was, <laughs> I was like 
Yeah. Unexpected victim. I mean, babysitter. Yeah. Yeah. We love when people ask us to hold their kids. That's how I knew we were coming out of COVID when the, when the uh, people started letting us hold their children again. I was like, oh, yay. Ew. No one's ever offered to hold my children. No, I don't they want to don't, They don't send off those vibes. They kind of send off the, maybe I won't have children vibes. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hold anybody's kids. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay, anything else that you feel like would we should know or are fun facts or just any knowledge you've ever wanted to share with the internet about anything like this, Nick? Well, I'm definitely taking back some of these tips that you guys wrote about different items you'd like to see on board. And I'm going to, write them to my airline. I don't know that they'll listen. They won't probably, but you know, a little bit of feedback goes a long way. And if you are ever involved in a medical emergency, one way that you can influence the particular policies of that airline are for you yourself to write when you get that survey or whatever into um, the airline directly and say, I was involved. I mm -hmm. really could have used mm -hmm. a whole box. Oh, that's Please. a good idea. Yeah. Because they're much more likely to listen to passengers mm -hmm. than they are to their own staff. So, um, yeah, if you are involved, you guys actually have the power to, in numbers anyways, you have the power yeah. to, uh, to get things changed. And as the consumer, it's kind of like in healthcare where all day it's like, I can complain all day, but I need the patient mm -hmm. to get mad and to write something mm -hmm in this case. So that's a good idea. Cause I did write a letter to, so, and you can do this too, if you're, you know, bored to your federal legislature people, right. Cause you would need the FAA in this case to want to reg like require different things mm -hmm. in the kits. So I just wrote off, you know, you know, I talk to these people all the time. They're probably like, see me and they're like, Oh, did you send gosh. a letter to Pete also Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg, Buttigieg. Ah. right? This Who's is the Pete? guy, Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Is that, God, I'm, I'm, I've had him on a flight, by the way. Yeah, I didn't so he was till afterwards, but yeah. yeah. I mean, he's the what is it? The Secretary of Transportation. Thank you. Oh no, I just wrote it to my state. I have five college degrees. My local so representative, and I said you should really care about this. Here's why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say CC Pete and his office as well, and also tag him on Twitter about that. I mean, look, you know, I think as nurses, oh, this has been so enlightening that, you know, consumers and nurses, I mean, we're all, we all fly and we'd love to travel. Nurses travel a lot. I mean, I think we drop a big dime on travel and, you know, it's important that patients feel safe and have confidence in their experience. And it's not something that, you know, airlines want to lead with in their marketing campaign, but it, it, you know, it literally could be right. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. flying flights out of Florida and people are a little bit older I'd kind of want to know or out of Palm Springs or, you know, I mean, where people mm -hmm. might be getting a little older, you'd, you'd want that confidence, right? That, Hey, we've got all the equipment to make sure that you're safe because all it will take is that one bad time or that one time when it doesn't all work out very well to, you know, make it, make something, you know, not, you know, have a bad experience, but yeah. I think this is really cheap stuff. It doesn't cost a lot. I just think a couple other things like in that kit, like you're saying, a couple other drugs, a couple other pieces of equipment, some remote monitoring equipment, remote telemetry equipment. Very important. I, guess I just want an OB kit. Just and give me OB an OB kit. kit. Yes. I'll be happy. Yeah. OB kit. Go chew on some Pitocin cord. Everything's fine. <laughs> a um, Pitocin I gotta go pick jerky. up my kids. Mr. Midwife also has to go. So go follow his YouTube channel. I will link it down below. He's great. Bye. Thanks for being here. Bye guys. Um, uh, but oh, yeah. Crazy. Oh no, we don't have to leave. And then, um, well, we'll probably go soon. My, yep. My babysitter leaves right now. So my children will be running wild. You'll probably meet them all soon. Um, but yeah, I think this is very helpful. Thanks team. Uh, yeah. and especially to you, Nick, that was really, really helpful to have all of your insights on it. I thought this was, I learned a lot. This, this has been a really weird experience. It's going to be a classic. This yeah, this video will be one of your classics. I think it's I good. So. Nick, are you on TikTok? Or you don't um, do social? I have one. I'll figure out what the name is. I don't, it's probably the same. It's probably uh, video. Okay, because a friend of mine, there's, I mean, I know a bunch of flight attendants on TikTok. So that flying guy. Yeah. There's a yeah. bunch of people I know on TikTok that are flight attendants. I so. think there is a nurse flight attendant thing because I follow also, a bunch of flight attendants on yeah. YouTube. Like yeah. I like to see where they go yeah, and then they show you their hotels. 
And I'm like, please. You're the funniest people. You guys need to start looking at flight attendant memes because I look at nurse memes. They are the funniest and they translate. (laughs) Right. But, you know, flight attendants are so much more um, tactful. Yeah. You guys are so much more like put together as humans. Like, so the galley yes. is the equivalent of our nurses station. Okay. And okay. when that curtain gets closed, that's when we vent. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. See, that's good details. We're very messy people too. We really <laughs> yeah. But you look so much more put together. Like I go into work when I was a nurse and people were like, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I would just... sometimes go to work and then realize I had not even brushed my hair. I had literally That's ran okay. my fingers through my hair. I'm like... not going to lie. I got up at 630 in the morning for my seven o'clock shift. Uh-huh. Yep. And I had a 10 I had an eight minute commute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I wasn't wearing shoes. Uh-huh. Um, just, just as I... a disclaimer. That's how yourself. I always look put together. We know. I don't doubt we know. that. I don't I doubt do, that at all. I do wear Crocs up until the moment I get out of my car. So, okay. So that, okay. Okay. Crocs are back on. Yeah. See, that seems more, I have twice in my nursing career showed up to work in slippers that were like clearly slippers only to then realize I'm wearing slippers. And I had to call my husband to be like, I'm wearing my pink fluffy slippers. Oh, I just put, I just put booties over mine. I did that. And, but I was like, I can't. I don't know that I mentioned anywhere along the line. I thought being a flight attendant would be, I actually applied to be a flight attendant and got a call back, I think from United. I, they sent me a ticket to Chicago to interview. And then I realized I'm a little tall for the cabin, even though they said it would probably be okay. And I probably have better opportunities in my other field. But then again, yeah. I grew up with my, my, my aunt was a stewardess when they were still called stewardesses. Mm-hmm. And they wore the high heel shoes, you know, going through the, the terminal. And it was a glamorous, there was a glamour about. The, the Playboy uh, Bunny era? All, almost. It was just, yeah, yeah, 70s, 80s. And uh, she, you know, would take us on and we got to see the cockpit and everything. It was just, there was a, there was something cool about it all. But then of course you realize you're in a different hotel a lot, you know, when you're overnight and it's not really glamorous. You're dealing with drunk people, you're serving them cocktails. You're dealing with people that drop in flight. You're going through all of your training that you have to go through. Then you're getting, you know, you're dead tired from your flight and you got to get into some kind of cab and go over to the hotel and check into a hotel and then try, yeah. Not as glamorous, I'm sure, as it looks. That, yeah, and it's very lonely. People don't realize that because we work with different mm. people all the time. One big reason I want to go into nursing is I love nurse personalities. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really like you guys seem to have a camaraderie on the unit, on the floor, at the office. That um, because we work with different people every trip, we just don't have an, mm. a chance to really build those connections. Now, we all get along, but it's you know, we have three days together and then it's good luck. See you later. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That's true. That you would kind of have like, yeah, a little mini, boom, like being a travel nurse. Yeah. Well, sure. it's something you're interested in, Nick, from what I can see, you're, you're in the right headspace to start and you got a head start with dealing with people and even dealing with emergencies. It's kind of like I was saying before, I wanted to be an emergency nurse because I figure every nurse has to be an emergency nurse sometime i mean liz had to do it last weekend <laughs> against her will but you know i just wanted to do it full time and i didn't want to be in a situation where i didn't know what to do in a situation like that which is why yes it should have been me but you know it should have but and also the, as a general work. encouragement to all people if you're a healthcare person who has to do this and you're like this also is your nightmare you'll be surprised at how much you do know you know what i mean like I was very shocked walking into a situation, obviously I worked in family practice for year, like, and then I was in peds. So like med surge was a long time ago and this was definitely a med surge type of thing that was happening, but you know more than you actually think you do. I think like just the basics, you know what I mean? Like Scott mm-hmm. said, assessing, what do they look like? What do we think we're dealing with here at baseline? And what are the very basic things I can do to help? And deep down, you do know that, you know what I mean? Like you'll be fine. If I was fine. And we talked yeah. before about, you know, learning what sick looks like mm-hmm. versus not sick. Mm-hmm. And because I remember you said, you know, it was something difficult. And it's like, it's really not. Once you learn what a healthy person looks like and you know what to pay attention to, like skin color and sweating and mm-hmm. breathing and walking. Once you know what a healthy person looks like, I mean, I didn't know much about babies, but when they came into the ER and the baby's like, you know, crying and bubbly mm-hmm. and 
you know, moving all its extremities and kind of pink. I'm like, well, this seems like it's acting like a normal baby. So I'm not really mm -hmm. like freaked out. They're not like floppy baby blue. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know what's wrong, but I know they're not in dire straits. Yeah. Same thing going the other exactly. way. If you're not used to working with adults, you know, you I know it. more than you, than you think you do. Yeah. You know what sick looks like. And that was my exact other experience on a flight. The one other time I've done something was the person was having anxiety, which sounds like from what Nick said, one of the biggest causes of it. And immediately I could tell, cause they were like, oh, I'm having a heart attack. I was like, no friend, like you're just not. Cause I know what that looks like. <laughs> like, I know you're not like, we'll check it, but you're not. So there, well, this was really helpful. Thanks, Nick. Oh, thank you guys. You know, and Adrian is Thanks, Nick. And thank you. No, Nick was <laughs> like appreciate a superstar. You. Um, go check out everyone's social medias. Does anyone else have anything you want to add in post or before we wrap up? Just my normal stuff. Check out my channel. Like this. Make cool sure you guys merch. like this uh, video, subscribe and share the video. You guys. Do compressions. I know compressions that. an odd number of times. Odd number okay. of times. <laughs> odd number of times. <laughs> it's the only way to save people. Gently odd tap, number of times. Gently tap the like button. <laughs> Thanks friends. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. I hope you learned something. It was fun. I appreciate you. Nick, you can stay on. There's like a post chat huddle. It's very fun. Very okay. exclusive. You're invited. And we'll see everyone else next time. After party, man. The after party. <laughs> Basically where I say, bye, I have to go get my children. Thanks for being here, friends. I hope you know that you, you can do hard things. You can, you can help people on planes. You're more than enough. And you're not alone. We did it backwards. It's fine. Bye.